invite you to open your Bibles or your devices to Luke chapter 18. That's where we're going to be looking today. And we're in a series, a mini-series, for four weeks called Breakthrough 2021. And hopefully you were here as we launched into that last week. And if you weren't, I would highly encourage you to get online our Facebook page or our website and, and watch that message. Because it'll help you get where we are and it'll also help you launch into this potential breakthrough. And all of us need a breakthrough. If you, if you need a breakthrough in 2021, say, I do. We all do. And, and, and there's seasons in our life where we all just need a breakthrough. And the problem is often that we go about it the wrong way. And uh, by, by definition, the word breakthrough is this, an instance of achieving a success in a particular sphere or activity. It also means a sudden or dramatic or important discovery or development. And that's what we're talking about. That's what we need with God. This sudden or dramatic moment where things change. Where we push through the envelope of where we've been stagnant for so long. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't, God is willing, the question is, are we willing to receive it? And so we have to learn how to posture ourselves, put ourselves in a position under God where we realize, I can't do this by myself. But God, you're bigger than I am. Just like we just sang, you are a way maker. You make things happen when they should not happen. You make a way when there is no way. And so God, I want to learn and I want to do what I need to do so I can put myself under what it is, God, that you want to do based on on your word and based on the love that you have for me as a child. Now, there's something special and supernatural when we get close to God. Because a breakthrough happens when we get close to God. That's it. And, and so the question is, how do we get closer to God? We only get closer to God through Jesus, His Son. He has made a way. And when we get closer to God, maybe hopefully in your life. Now, I want you to listen right now. I need you to lean in. Maybe sometime in your life... You've had a moment where you felt like you and God were like connected. And like it was like this moment where you're like, okay, God's real. He's, he's here with me. I feel his love surrounding me. It's real. If you've had a, just a moment, just a moment like that, maybe while praying, maybe in a circumstance or a situation, no matter if you've had a moment or just a, a, a little spot of that, say, I have. I want you to know if you're born again, You've had that. The problem is most people survive on a nugget of reality that happened sometime in the past. God wants to be fresh to you every day. God wants to pour himself into your life every day. And that's what breakthrough is all about. In Philippians 4.13, we find out how we can experience greatness. He says, I am able to do all things. <laughs> Not on my own. It says, through the one who strengthens me. It's all about Jesus in our life. In Romans 8.37, it says, No, in all things we have complete, not partial, not temporary, complete victory through Him, through Jesus who loves us. All right? So what we have to do to experience breakthrough is get closer to God. And we do that by getting closer to God's Son, who is Jesus. And so, how do we do that? Well, we talked about last week some foundations for breakthrough. We talked about, we looked back in Daniel, and we saw that Daniel first got his directions from the Word of God. He didn't listen to what men said. He didn't listen to what government said. He listened to what the Word of God said, and that's where he found his directions for life. We saw also a dedication that he said, I'll turn my face to God. In a world of confusion that he lived in, in the world of confusion that you live in, we have have to be faithful and, and, and focused in saying, I'm just going to look to God. I'm going to tap myself on the chin, stop looking at the news. I'm going to tap myself on the chin, stop looking at the reality of my relationship. I'm going to tap myself on the chin and look above my addiction. I'm going to tap myself on the chin and look above the circumstances of my world. And I'm going to focus on God. Thirdly, we saw past the direction and dedication of devotion that he said, I will pray to God. He prayed to God. We, and that's what we're going to talk about today is pray, prayer. Now, last, last week, we finished up on a demonstration of our desire for a breakthrough. 
Daniel had it. We talked about fasting occurs over 75 times in the Word of God. And, and fasting is an abstinence of, fo- absence of food in our life. That's what it meant biblically. But it also means to, to, to um, remove something physical from our life in hope of something spiritual filling that void. And we put in your hands a guide, a prayer and fasting for 21 days of breakthrough. We put it in your hands. If you didn't get one of those, it's okay. You can get one when you leave today if you got one say I got one if you started and started going through your book say I did all right all right you're on your way you're on your way now some of us last week stood up had the books and I'm in okay we left out of here went over to Aubrey's and ate about eight million calories okay as soon as we got out of Aubrey's we checked our Facebook Okay, went home, watched the news, whatever it is that burdens us, okay, whatever our thing is that God, you know, God wants you to fast from, to separate for a while. You didn't do it, and you're like, man, you left here, you say, I'm standing, I'm in, and then the wheels fell off the bus. Turned into a big zero before you ever got to the end of the first day, okay? You don't have to say, man, that's me, but some of us did that. It's okay. Maybe some of us went two, three days, and we're like, man, I'm in, and fourth day, you know, you're having withdrawals. i got to check my Facebook, you know? And so you got on social media, okay? Maybe that's you. Okay, whatever it is, but listen to me. It's okay. Failure is okay as long as we don't keep failing at the same thing. Failure is an opportunity to learn. And so I want to encourage you, even if you didn't do well the first seven days, start again today. If you didn't start with us last week, start today. Because listen, this we're talking about communicating, getting in touch with God for a breakthrough, for something significant in our life that only comes from God. And so maybe you did well this week. I did well this week. Maybe you did well this week. I've already started to experience some breakthroughs. I'm serious. And so maybe you did well. I don't care where you're at on that journey, on that timeline. The best is on the horizon and not in the past. So we're going to look forward to what God has in store for for us over the next 14 days, if you're just starting, over the next 21 days. Because when we do this, we will experience breakthrough in our life. Now, how can we make that happen? We've started the fasting thing, and we said fasting and prayer. People always preach on prayer, right? You hear people, you need to pray, you need to pray, you need to pray. Every, Every Christian knows he needs to pray. But at the end of the day, I got a question of transparency for you. How many of you have ever felt like a total reject when it comes to your prayer life your silent hand the silent hand nobody's going amen that okay sometimes I feel like I'm praying to myself I'll be praying and I'll say something to God I'll impress myself and I'll think about it man that sounded good I've never said that before I've never used that expression that's cool okay and the whole time God's on his throne says anybody know why Joel's praying to himself Okay, or or maybe sometimes I feel like I'm praying at somebody like I get wound up think start praying over somebody because they're being stupid or whatever and I'm praying over them all all of a sudden I'm just mad at this person and God say anybody know why he's mad at that guy anybody know why he's doing that okay prayer gets confusing sometimes okay and and, and so today what we're going to talk about is prayer and we're going to talk about how to have a breakthrough prayer life. Now, i got to share this story. I, I've wanted a breakthrough prayer life since about 1988. 1988, Kendra and I joined a huge church down in Chattanooga. And it was amazing. And the preacher, man, he just preached the word of God unapologetically. And the worship was awesome. And so we went on a Wednesday night. And, man, he said, it's going to be prayer night. We're like, yeah, it's good. prayer's got to be good because everything else is good. So, so I... They said, okay, now, after a little message, said, we're going to get in groups and we're going to pray over this list we've given you. So we want you to join hands with about seven or eight people around you and pray. And I looked up, and I don't know what happened. Kendra and I ended up in the senior adult ladies section. And so now we're holding hands in a circle with about seven senior adult women. And they said, yeah, just, one of the ladies said, we'll just start over here. We'll go all the way around the circle and everybody pray. I don't, I don't do that. I mean, I had prayed over my food, okay? I'd prayed to get saved. I had a couple 911 prayers worked in there, but I had never like prayed in a group. Kendra, you remember it? I, the expression I was used, I was puckered up. Okay? So here's what happened they started praying, and man, they prayed heaven down. I mean, they prayed in the Holy Spirit, have his way, come down, fire of heaven. I mean, they just going all the way around. And the more they prayed, the scareder I got. And my time's coming. And they said, if you want to pass, all you have to do is squeeze the hand next to you. And that lets them know they're going to pray. I had one problem. The hand next to me with Ken, was Kendra. 
I had to go home with her. I couldn't throw her under the bus. So in that moment, she squeezed my hand. It's my turn. I'm at the crossroads. And I prayed. And, and God gave me a, a prayer. Probably a silly little prayer. But it was prayer. And the truth is, that moment was significant. It was the moment that I became somebody I was not before. I became somebody who was willing to say, God, you're bigger than this. You're bigger than this circle of prayer warriors that you stuck me in. Okay? And Kendra prayed. And our journey was launched in that little season right there, wasn't it, Kendra? And it's been amazing. Something happens. But here's the problem. Sometimes, just like that, you find yourself in a space, in a place, where you feel like you should pray, and you don't know how to pray. You don't know how, know how to get started. You, you, you hear people say you need to spend, okay, if you're spending an hour a day on social media, you need to spend an hour a day in prayer. If you're spending an hour a day watching the repetitive news, you need to spend an hour a day in prayer. If you're spending an hour a day watching nothingness on television, that includes sports, then you need to spend an hour a day in prayer. If you, need to, if you spend an hour a day surfing for some material thing on a Craigslist or eBay, you need to spend an hour a day in prayer. It just keeps everything balanced, right? And then you go try to pray for an hour. Now, why is it so much easier to do this for an hour? And it's so hard to do this for an hour. You pray, man, you pray, you pray everything you know to pray. You look up at the clock, it's been four minutes. Seems like 54 I want to help you understand God wants you to spend 54 and it seemed like four. And we're going to learn that today and we're going to see that today. Now, there was an evangelist in America. He's dead now, but he was incredible. And his name was Leonard Ravenhill. (laughs) What a cool, that that even has evangelist name. You know, that just has tenacity. Leonard Ravenhill. All right. And this is what he said about prayer. He said, no man is greater than his prayer life. He said, a pastor who is not praying is just playing and a church who's not praying is straying and then he said if we fail at this we fail at everything man woe is me I'm I choked okay because I don't pray well I haven't done well in my prayer life but we're going to learn how to do better today we need to learn that prayer is not an not an obligation even though Jesus expects it It's a privilege. I mean, think about it. You know you. I know me. The fact that God would be willing to entertain my silliness in my in who I am to come into the presence of his greatness in prayer. That's that's pretty heavy stuff. And so it's a privilege that we get. And I said last week something I had never said before, and it stuck with me. God hears us when we don't pray. I think often God is more amazed than he is amused at our prayerlessness. That we go days and weeks and months and we never even utter his name in prayer. And so, how should we pray? Because there's all kinds of ideas. Well, I read this real interesting little poem about options for prayer or philosophies for prayer. It goes like this. It's called the prayer of Cyrus Brown. It says, the prayer... The proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keyes, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped and upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Slow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with his eyes fast closed and his head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerely clasped in front, with both thumbs pointing toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year, I fell into Hodgkin's well. Head first, said Cyrus Brown. With both my heels a-sticking up, my head was a-punting down. As I made a prayer right then and there, best prayer I ever said, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed was a-standing on my head. Now, Quite honestly, I resonate with Cyrus Brown. I can pray when my world is upside down. I pray best when my world is in absolute calamity. I pray best when things around me aren't going the way I think they should go. But the truth is, all of those are fair. On our knees, hands clasped, eyes closed, looking up, standing up, 
We just need to be people of prayer. Tell the person next to you, you need to pray more. It's true for every single person in here. I'll say it uh, for everybody. All of y'all need to pray more. How do I know? Because if our church became a church full of prayer warriors, people willing to dive into prayer in conversation with God, seeking His will, letting Him know our needs and our requests, this church would be a different church, and it's a great church. But it would explode, and God would do the supernatural because we are willing to come before Him in prayer. In the Bible, how significant is prayer? Well, depending on how you parse or separate phrases in the Bible, there are no less than 200 and 20 prayers in the Bible. And like I said, depending on how you separate it, there are as many as 650 prayers in the Word of God. That means prayer is significant to God. So today's message is this, a breakthrough prayer life. The first point that I want you to consider is the word priority. Priority. That's what we're going to see today. In Luke chapter 18, Beginning in verse 1, we're going to read just the first, the first half of the first verse. It says, then Jesus, you know what's important, is Jesus talking. It says, then Jesus told them a parable for a reason, to show them they should always pray. Now listen to me. Jesus is teaching a story. He's telling a story, teaching a truth. All right? He's, it says, he, he gave them a parable to show them. The reason he's getting ready to unfold the story before us this week and next week is because he wants his disciples to know that they should always or, or should never stop praying. Now, here's the question. If you're not a disciple of Jesus, this is not for you. You can close your eyes, lean back, take a nap. That's what I'd do if I was lost, okay? If you are a disciple of Jesus, what is a disciple? A follower of Jesus, if you've said, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I want you to save me, adopt me into your kingdom. You're a disciple of Jesus. I want you to understand, if you want him to be your Savior uh, without him being your Lord, he won't be your Savior unless he's your Lord. And he can't be your Lord unless he's your Savior. And so, but if that's true for you, if you've given yourself to Jesus, you are a disciple. So this truth, this story, this parable is for you. And he says, disciple, follower of Jesus, I'm going to tell you a story because prayer should be a priority in your life. Tell the person next to you, it really needs to be a priority. Just go ahead and tell them. Now, we, we, don't, we don't just have to look at the words of Jesus, although that's the paramount of anything we'll learn, the most significant. We can look over in 1 Thessalonians. It'll tell us this, always rejoice constantly pray or pray without ceasing do not be anxious for anything instead in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving tell your request to God we supposed we're supposed to be prayers we also learn in Philippians 4 7 and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now it should be a priority. It's a priority that comes with fringe benefits. The peace of God will come into our life when we pray. Now, next. Now, uh, the second thing, and we're only going to have two points today. You'll like to know this. There's two points today. The second point is persistence. <laughs> that don't mean we're halfway done. That just means we're halfway done with the points. Okay. The second point, which is the one we're going to dive into, is persistence. Now, last week, uh, of the four uh, foundations for breakthrough, we kind of emphasized fasting. That fasting was uh, uh, abs uh, abstaining from food, but it's also abstaining from anything physical, physical so we could experience something spiritual. We gave you a whole list of things that you could fast from. We talked about how you do it. We talked about how long they needed to be. We talked about all that. Backing up, when, when it talked about uh, Daniel's devotion, we're going to talk about prayer. And our persistence regarding our prayer. Now let me just go ahead and confess something. I failed in this in parts of my life in the past. Kendra knows it's true. Kendra sometimes, she, she wants to be the, the one who tells me what to pray for. In fact, she asked me, she says, won't you pray? And part of me won't say, won't you pray? You know, I pray all the time. I do pray all the time. She knows I pray all the time. She prays all the time too. But there's that moment, like when we get ready to go to bed. Won't you pray? I'm like, spiritual giant I don't know I didn't know what it was okay but I've been she said pray for this and I've said this before and it's wrong I said I'm not gonna pray for that I've already prayed for that 
And if I pray for that again, it's going to demonstrate that I don't have faith in God hearing my last prayer. That prayer is already in the throne room. It's already been delivered. The mail is delivered. We're waiting for an answer. That's wrong. And I didn't get it. That's wrong. Persistence. It means, by definition, to continue even in the face of discouragement. Even in the, faith, uh, in, in the face of pushback. Okay? It means to obstin obstinately move forward in our prayer life. Now watch what it says in this story that Jesus is telling about persistence. The second half, he, so Jesus, verse 1 again, it says, And Jesus told them a parable, show them they should always pray and not lose heart. Persistence. Then he goes on to verse 2. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. And there was also a widow in that city who kept coming to him. Who kept coming to him. <clears throat> widow kept coming to the judge. Widow kept coming to the judge. And saying, give me justice against my adversary. Persistence. Okay, now it's odd. When you read this text, you, you see some unusual things. You see a lot of namelessness. It says, there was a, it says there was a certain city, a city with no name. And there was a judge, but a judge with no name. And there was a widow and a widow with no name. But there's a request that is spoken, not a general request. The request is, give me justice against my adversary. Now, why all the namelessness? Why did Jesus leave this story for his disciples 2,000 years ago and for you in 2021 without names? You ready? I truly believe because God and Jesus in his story wants to allow you to write your name in his story. He, 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 the story would read like this. There was a certain city and its name was Knoxville. There was a certain city and its name was Powell. There was a certain city and it was called Oak Ridge. There was a certain city and it was called Norris. There was a certain city and it was called Clinton. There was a certain city and it was called your city. And then it goes on and it says, and there was a judge. There's a judge with no name. As a disciple, you have a judge and he has a name. Your judge is Jesus. So there's a certain city for me called Knoxville. And, and there's a, a, a judge whose name is Jesus. And, and, there's a, uh, and there's a widow or somebody who is in need, who has a request. That's Joel. That's the pastor at the church at Sturkey Hills. And there's a request. Give me justice against my adversary. You know what this is saying? It's saying every single one of us is in this story. He, he launches into this and he says every single person that's a disciple of Jesus can be written into this story. And so as we keep reading, we're going to find out more about it. Now, persistence is the thing in this story that keeps, that keeps the story going forward. You see, if the story said there was a certain city with a certain judge and a certain widow who came and prayed, uh, give me justice against my adversary and then he just kept going on to some other story there's no value in that but this story goes on why because this woman kept going on she just kept going back you ever heard the expression squeaky wheel gets the grease that's her you know what church we ought to be the squeakiest church that ever comes before God in prayer. We ought to squeak. That's what he ought to hear from, from the church at Sturkey Hills. That we just, man, we are crying out to him over and over and over. Now, we're going we're gonna to understand something today about when we know we can stop praying and when we know it's time to continue in our prayer. James 5.16 says this, the prayer of a righteous person. Now, some translations, which I like better, says the fervent prayer of a righteous person has great effectiveness. The word fervent, the reason why I like fervent, is because in the Greek, the word is ener, uh, energeo. We get our word energy or energetic. It means the energetic, the forceful, the committed, the dedicated, the powerful prayer of a righteous person. You're not righteous except from Jesus. So it's the, 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 the strong, committed, powerful prayer of somebody who is saved by Jesus. Okay? Availeth, accomplish, seeth much accomplished. Okay? And so that's how we're supposed to be. So sometimes we get the wrong idea uh, about 
about our prayers. We pray and we think, yeah, I'm not going to pray that again because I pray it every day. You ever feel like your prayers are, you're reading them off of a Christmas card? You know, it's just the same thing over and over. God, I pray for my family. I pray for Kendra. I pray for Max and Caitlin and Judson and Juliana. I, I pray for Clark and Kelsey. I pray for little Major. You know, I pray that this, I put, pray a hedge of protection around them. You know, and it kind of feels redundant. It's not. Not to God. God learns, listen, oh, God learns from our prayer language what's most important to our heart. That's powerful. You write that down. God learns from our prayer language what's most important to our heart. And as a child of God, God cares what's important to your heart. God cares for what you care for. And so you, maybe, maybe you, you're praying for a breakthrough about an addiction you have. The, the addiction can have whatever flavor you want it to have. And, and you're just praying that God would give you breakthrough over that. And maybe you're praying for a broken relationship. A relationship that seems to be beyond repair. Uh, maybe you're praying uh, for overcoming anxiety. You know, that thing just kind of climbs on your back in the world we live in and just wants to drive you in the ground. Uh, no matter what your breakthrough is, listen, persistently pray to God. God wants you to persistently pray. It's, it's like this. Maybe I've prayed a hundred times for a new job. Maybe I've prayed a hundred times or more, 500 times, to be delivered from an addiction. Maybe I've prayed 750 times for a relationship that's broken. And it doesn't seem like God has answered. I want you to know something. All of those, as examples, are in the will of God. A delivery from addiction, freedom from addiction, that's the will of God. Delivery from anxiety or some, some form of, uh, of, of sickness, that's in the will of God. Um, restoration to a relationship, that's in the will of God. So listen to me. God always answers your prayers. Every single prayer. I hear people say, I, mean, I just don't think God's answering my prayer. Oh, he answered. Oh, he answered. Three answers. In, in its simplest form, no, yes, and wait. Now, no simply means this. Your prayer is not in the will of God. God, I just got me some scratch-offs. I pray this is the mothership. I'm going to give a whole lot to the church because we're building a new building. The answer, no. He ain't blessing you scratch-off. Stay there right now. Mama needs a new parachute. He ain't blessing that. Okay, no, I'll answer that for him. I can show you in Scripture. Okay, uh, but the others, when your prayer is in the will of God, he's not going to say no if, it's, if your prayer is in the will of God. He wants to say yes if it's in the will of God. But what about the wait? The wait is that season between the prayer and the fruition that it just doesn't happen. It's a season that's really, most of the time, worse than no. Honestly, there have been a lot of times, I wish he'd just say no. I wish he'd just go plunk right on my head and say, not happening, keep moving. Okay? But he leaves me in this season. Why? Because in the waiting is where he develops our faith. In, his, in the waiting is where he develops our tenacity to press on, where his grace is sufficient. He says, I'm going to deliver you, but not now. You just keep going forward. In the waiting is where God develops us. Because if every time we went to him like he was the Wizard of Oz, every time we went to him he's the genie in a bottle, and he just, bam, he just gave it to us, we would learn from that other than he gives me everything I want. And that's not his goal for our life. Let me give you an example. Because I've dealt with this many times. A young girl, she might be 19 years old. And she sees her life wasting away. She doesn't have a significant other yet. And some of her friends, her older sister, cousins, all got married. She doesn't even have a guy, but she, so she's anxious. So she starts seeing this guy. And all of a sudden, she wants to be with this guy forever because he wants her to marry him. And he's a thug. He's just a loser. He's a turd in a punch bowl. 
I mean, he is just everything. He brings everything bad into everything good. You know what I'm saying? He brings nothing good to the table. He's lost as Adam's rooster. He don't know Jesus. And yet this girl, she loves him so much that now she tells you, I've prayed about it. I've prayed about it. And God told me it's okay that I'm supposed to marry him because he wants to use me to help him get to God. And then they ask me, oh, really? I don't know who you've been praying to. I don't know who you've been listening to. But the answer to that equation is no. He will answer that prayer. And the answer will be no. So here's the question. How do we align our prayers with the will of God? How do we know with certainty that our prayer is in alignment with the will of God? You ready? From the word of God. Okay, let's apply scripture to that particular scenario. Over in 2 Corinthians 6, 14. You could read this to the young lady. Do not become partners with those who do not believe. You could stop right there. But in case they accuse you of taking it out of context. It says, for what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? Scripture... Is the way we know the will of God. Are you ready? The will of God is found in the word of God. Say that with me. We get the will of God from the word of God. Say that. That's where we get it. So listen. It's why it's so important. Listen. I want to to encourage you man. Listen. You get this book. And you begin to read it. And every time you see something in there that's a promise from God. A commitment from him. To you, you just highlight it, fold the page down, write it down in your journal, whatever you need to do. And when you pray, you start praying the yeses of God. You just start praying, God, just like you said. (laughs) Just like you said over here. Mm -hmm. When you pray like that, God's listening. Why? Because he cannot go back against his word. Number two, he knows now you're digging in his word. Now he will reward you just for getting in his word and holding God accountable, not that you need to, to his word. You pray the will of God when you pray the word of God. It's why it's important that you know God's word. So persistence uh, is the word we're looking for. And, And prayer is not the way to get God to do what you want him to do. It's not what prayer is. Prayer is the way, the tool that we tap into what God already wants to do. That's what prayer is. God, listen, God is your father. He's your heavenly father. He wants to spend, he's made provision for you and he will spend, listen, eternity with you. He wants what's best for you. He wants, he wants, He wants good things in your life. His yeses are so, so far greater than the no's. Because the yeses are his stuff. Knowing the beginning to the end. His good stuff. And the no's stand against what we only see partial truth about. And so praying is the way we tap into what God already wants to do in in our life. Now, I want you to understand something here about the will of God. There's the unconditional will of God. The unconditional will of God is, are the things that happen regardless of circumstance, regardless of anything, regardless of you, regardless of me, regardless of us. It does not matter what happens on this planet. God has an unconditional will. It is going to happen beyond any condition. No matter what the conditions, His will will happen. Okay? In other words, when God's unconditional will was to create earth and all of the universe, he didn't have to wait for conditions to be right. He didn't have to wait for anything. He took absolute nothingness and whispered into it and created absolute everythingness. Conditions around it, the fact that there was nothing existing did not matter for his unconditional will to come to fruition. Okay? Now there's a second side of that, which is his conditional will. His conditional will is that he has a will for things to happen, but it's conditioned on things around it. And one of those, he has a will for your life, and it's conditioned on your life. Let me give you an example. In 2 Peter 3, 
it says that God is patient and willing that none should perish, but that all should have eternal life. That's his unconditional will. That he's patient and that he doesn't want anybody to go to hell and he wants everybody to be saved. Okay, it's unconditional. So then why are not everybody saved? Does that mean everybody's going to heaven? It does not. Because wider is the way to destruction than the one that leads to righteousness. Scripture says that. Here's what we know. Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now that's cool, isn't it? We have the unconditional will that all be saved. And we have the conditional will in particular to me. And the condition is that I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart and place myself in there into what he's done. That's how, that's, that's how it is. So here's what we do. <clears throat> God's going to do what he's going to do because he has an unconditional will. But I want you to know the reason we pray is because our prayers influence the will of God conditioned on our faithfulness and our persistence in coming to him with our prayer request. Our goal in prayer is to get God to reach from heaven and do something here. That's our goal in prayer. I, I don't know if you pray for any other reason, but if you do, it's the wrong reason. Your goal in prayer should be that the God of heaven would reach from heaven and touch and do something here on earth in our circle where we are. And so when we demonstrate a willingness to align ourselves with the will of God through persistence in prayer, we will experience a prayer, a breakthrough in our prayer life. Now, how many of you have ever heard somebody say, you need to pray more? Boy, if you'll pray, you line yourself, and then you walk out the doors and you say, boy, that's good. I, I don't know where to go from here. You know, it's like you 16 years old, you've never driven a car in your life. Said, look here, what we got you for birthday, a set of keys for your car. Car's out in the driveway. Go get it. Bang. That's what's going to happen right there. Okay? They don't know how to drive. And, and often, people tell you to do something, you don't know how to do it. I want to help you today. We're going to learn a tool that will help you pray. Okay? It's a cool tool. And uh, it's, it's helped me, and it'll help you. I, I've, I've done this. I've got, gotten in my prayer closet, gotten alone. Maybe I'm driving down the road. Maybe I'm sitting in my car. Maybe I'm up at the house sitting in my chair. Maybe I'm laying on the couch. Might be laying in the bed. My prayer closet is wherever God has me in the moment when he says, Hey, don't we need to pray here? Okay, he convicts my heart. We pray. I pray. Now, here's the thing. I've started praying thinking, you know, I'm going to pray like those old ladies that I was in the circle with. Okay, and I pray, and I pray, and then I run out of stuff. I think, whew, boy, that's, that's a good season of prayer. Whew, seven minutes. Okay. Okay, God's glad that I gave him seven minutes. But I left a whole lot on the table. His, his conditional will, there's still a whole lot of that hadn't been tapped into because I did not pray with persistence. So what is this tool? Everybody do like this. Okay. These are praying hands. I don't know if you knew that or not. I remember growing up. We had a marble or some kind of surround. I don't know what it was made out of. Praying hands. Anybody have praying hands at your house when you was growing up? I was the only one. Oh, me and Keith. Okay, right there. Bob. Me, Keith, and Bob. Three of us had praying hands. Okay, we had praying hands. Okay, just to remind us we need to pray. That's what it's for. So, just like the little poem, it doesn't mean you have to do like this every time you pray. And, you know, you're driving down the road. You need to pray. You know, that's not a good plan. Okay. But this will help you as a tool. Because it is okay to pray like this. We're going to start with our left hand. Our left hand is our who's that we're going to pray, supposed to pray for. Our right hand is our what's that we're supposed to pray for. Okay? Now, first of all, on the left hand, we're going to start with our thumb. Because when we're praying with praying hands, man, our thumb is closest to our heart. So we're supposed to pray first for our thumb closest to me. Family and friends. So we start out with our prayer. We're praying for our family by name. Okay, God, I lift up my family. God, I lift up my friends. Which friends? Which family? What? What is it about your family, your friends that you're praying for? Then we go on. Index finger. This is the one that points up. Our pointer finger reminds us to pray for people who lead. People who point people in the right direction. Preachers, teachers, first responders like police officers and firemen. We're going to pray for people who point people in the right direction. Thirdly, we're going to pray middle finger. This ain't for the people you don't like. Let me just go ahead and clear that up. Okay? I know you thought that. I didn't know where we're going. Some of y'all thought that when I was on the thumb. 
I know what that middle finger is about. That's the people we don't like. No, our middle finger rises up. It's the ones that rise above the rest. It's the influencers. We're going to pray for our politicians. Question, you think our polit uh, political world needs prayer? They have absolutely lost their mind, both sides. It don't matter if it's blue or red or purple. It don't matter. It's, they've lost their mind. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for the president that's leaving. We need to pray for the president that's coming in. We need to pray for the Senate. We need to pray for the Congress. We need to pray for our mayor. We need to pray for all of the people who rise above. Listen to me. We need to pray for celebrities. Celebrities have a tremendous amount of influence. Our athletic celebrities, our, our, our uh, acting celebra celebrities, um, our um, athletic celebrities. We need to pray for all of our celebrities because they have influence. Most of the time, not good and godly. We need to pray for them. Fourthly, we need to pray for our ring finger people. These are people who are weak. Why, did, why is that weak? Did you know your ring finger is considered the weakest finger on your hand? How do you know that? If you lay your finger on the table and you try to raise your fingers, your thumb comes right up, index, all of them come right up. But that ring finger, you got to focus. It's like a seance. Come up. Okay, you got to work it. But it's the weak, considered the weakest finger in the whole, on the whole hand. And so it's, it's to, there to remind us as we pray, the weak, the weak among us. Okay, who are the weak among us? The sick, the old, the senior adults, the widows, the shut-in, the poor, downtown, the 11B people. Pray for them. And lastly, we get to our little pinky finger. That is the pinky, the least of all of these. Our babies. Our babies that are here. The unborn. That God would move in our nation, in our world. That we would stop murdering babies. We're supposed to pray for our children. Man, the devil hates our children. The culture, the world hates our children. There's a system. There, there's an expression that says the way to change the future is to begin by changing the children. And we need to pray for our children. We need to pray for our orphans, the fatherless. And then lastly, me. It's, listen, it's okay to pray for you. But you shouldn't be what you pray for every day. You're messing up. You're not tapping into the will of God, the conditional will of God, when you're just praying for you all the time. You start praying for other people. You know what you'll realize? I don't have it as bad as I thought. Okay? It's okay to pray for me, but it needs to be down here, the least of these. Now we're going to move to the what I'm going to pray for, the right hand. Got our praying hands. Now we're thumb. Our thumb is closest to our heart. Our thumb, as it points to the heart, is that God created in me a clean heart. That's what David prayed. God created in me a clean heart. Develop in me a desire, a pursuit of holiness. His word says, be ye holy for I am holy. His word says, be ye perfect for I am perfect. P create in me a desire for holiness. That I want the better, I want the best and not just the good. Help God shine your light in my life for the little sins like David said. The little sins that spoil the vineyard. The little things that, the little foxes that, that spoil the vineyard. Show me what those are. Show me the sins of omission, the things I'm supposed to do that I hadn't done. The sins of commission, the things I'm doing that I should stop. Show me that so my heart will be pure. Then we go to our pointer finger. Pointer finger also means what? We number one. Okay? It's God highlight my priority list and my schedule. God, I'm inviting you to look into my priorities. How I spend my time how I spend my words. I'm looking at you. I'm asking you to look into my schedule, how I live my life. I'm inviting you to look into my finances, into my checking account, into my bank account to see where my priorities are because God, I want this finger to be pointing to you because if I get you right, if I make you the priority of my life, then all of the other priorities that I have will be accomplished and I won't have to worry about them. Then we move to our middle finger on our right hand. It's the, it's the things that rise above. My influence, my witness, and my testimony. God, now I pray. You know the world I live in. They don't know you. And I'm afraid to tell them. God, you know it's been months or years or maybe never that I've shared Jesus with somebody. God, you know it's been months since I even invited somebody to church. God, you know from my testimony and my witness and my lack of diligence, I don't really care for those around me. So God, I want you to ignite and empower my influence, my witness, and my testimony. That lives will change simply because 
I'm praying for them and I'm giving my testimony to you. And then we move to the weak finger, our ring, which also means a ring of commitment. It's relationships, marriage, family, church, and work. Now you say, wait a minute, Brother Joel. Over on the left hand, you already prayed for your family. Listen to me. Your family, your marriage, your children, you, be, you need to be praying for a double portion on that bunch. God wants you. God knows your heart and what you hold dearest to you. It's okay. Take your family to God. Stop trying to fix everything yourself. We got anybody fixed, do it, DIY Christians in here, raise your hand, confession time. Yeah, one of these, one of those. Yeah, your heart rose up, your eyebrow went up because you knew I was talking to you. We're DIY Christians, we won't fix everything. Stop that. You ain't God and you never will be. Meanwhile, God's got a conditional will waiting for you to tap into it, say, hey, I need your help on this. And he'll do that. And lastly, we get to our pinky finger on our right hand. Our material blessings, our wants, and our needs. Now listen to me. Most of our prayers are about me, myself, and I, and what I want and what I need. That's just true, okay? It's okay to pray for material blessings. Listen to me. It's okay to pray that God will give you a better job. It's okay that God will, that God will, that, to pray that God will give you a raise. It's okay that God will work powerfully in your resources. It's okay that God will give you a home, to pray that God will give you a home. It's okay to pray that God will provide you a new car. It's okay to pray that stuff, but it don't need to be on the thumb. It needs to be way down here on the pinky finger. Last thing, because it changes God's, the way God sees our desires. Now, lastly, it's like this. So we're praying like this. We made it through a list. Now, I'm going to tell you this is what happens. You remember I said when we pray sometimes it feels like 54 minutes and four minutes have gone by. When we pray like that, we will pray for 54 minutes. It'll seem like four minutes because we'll, get, we'll realize we're in it. We're in the zone, all right? We're in the place where God's listening, and, and He's helping me pray, and Jesus is interceding for me, and the Spirit is in this prayer, okay? And it gets really, really good. And then that's when we do this. We get ready to close. That's when we say, God, thank you so much that you, a holy, righteous, perfect, sovereign, true and living, one and only God, would choose to make a way through Jesus for me to be able to even come into your presence with my ten fingers of request and so I thank you I worship you and I look forward with great anticipation and expectation the answers to my prayer and the opportunity to do this again real soon and I'm telling you if we kind of start getting that right not checking boxes I got the ring finger but just working through that God will start hearing us and our lives will start experiencing a breakthrough in our prayer life. Now, one last thing and we'll close. How can you kind of track and monitor and not miss an opportunity to celebrate answered prayer? Twofold. Write them down specifically. Write your prayer request down specifically. God, I want you to bless my family. Okay, you got air, don't you? Okay, he, he blessed you. How do you even know what that means? Go before God and say, God, my family needs help and needs a blessing in these areas. And I want you to help in these areas. And you write them down. Okay? And then what happens, you start watching. And with, when specific things happen, you highlight it. And you celebrate and you go back to that Thanksgiving time. God, thank you for hearing my prayer. You answered that prayer. All right? You thank him. And you track what God's doing. Now listen to me. If he hadn't answered yet, that means you're the widow lady. That means persistence kicks in tomorrow. You keep praying for that specific thing. And align it with God's will. Found in God's word. And you'll experience a breakthrough in your prayer life. And you'll experience breakthrough in 2021. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe you're here today and, man, you just feel like you're 
way out there in the weeds somewhere and God seems so far away. Maybe it's because He is. Maybe it's because you've never began a relationship with God through Jesus, His Son. I just want you to know today, if that's you, God is ready to begin a relationship with you. It simply begins when you say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know, I'm, I, know I mess things up. And I know I can't fix it. I've tried to fix some of that stuff. I just can't do it. And I don't know why, but in this moment, I didn't really come here for this, but I feel like in this moment, you're reaching from heaven trying to get my attention. And God, if you're wanting to save me today, it's in this moment on this day, in the beginning of this new year, that I want to give my broken self. I repent and I confess of my sinful nature. And I bring myself to you. And I want to exchange all of me for all of Jesus. I want Jesus to come into my life. To wash me clean, to fill me with the Spirit, and to make me new from the inside out. I want Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of my life from this day forward. I know I can't do that on my own or in the flesh. So I ask for your help, for your helper, who is the Holy Spirit, to indwell my life. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Maybe your distance from God is not because you're lost. It may just be that you're backslidden. You've just walked away from God and forgot about Him. But in this day, it's a day that we say, God, help me. I'm so sorry that I've wasted your gift. I'm so sorry that I walked away from you. Of all things, I want to come back to you. Forgive my sin. Restore me. Help me live for you starting right now. And for the rest of us, simply pray, God, help me experience a breakthrough prayer life. I commit myself to this word, persistence, these two words, persistence and priority from this day moving forward. God, we thank you for allowing us to be in your presence today. I thank you so much for this little message found in Luke 18, the little story from Jesus that's so full of truth. God, help each one of us move closer to you so that you could do more through us. Thank you for everything, most of all, for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray.